Welcome to stream number 12. I uh, can't believe we're already at 12. It's crazy. Um, oh, that reminds me. I want to check something else real quick. One second, please. Where are we right now? What are we at? We are at 4,974 subscribers on YouTube. That is 26 away from 5,000. It is crazy. Uh, thank you guys so much for the support. Uh, amazing how much we've grown in, in a year's time. So uh, I hope that uh, lots of you are still enjoying my channel. I um, hope that you guys are enjoying all the live streams that I've been doing lately. Um, I don't know how many of you caught that I did an extra live stream on Sunday um, where I did all of the experimentation for my next episode in the object or uh, the object interaction tutorial series that I have been working on. So um, I'm starting to look at the different techniques for interacting with objects in a 3D world in VR, um, which of course, because you've got your hands that you can actually move around the world, uh, has some interesting options that you don't have in, uh, in a non-VR game. Um, because you can actually touch things with your hands and push things around and pick things up. Um, interestingly enough, I have been talking with one of my patrons, uh, Wapiti, I hope I didn't mangle your name there, buddy, uh, who is also experimenting with some of that sort of thing, uh, and he is doing stuff with um, joints in the physics engine to make things follow each other and, and do nice things. Um, so I'm starting to look into that as well because it looks like a really interesting technique. Um, whether whether that becomes part of the next tutorial, I'm not sure if that's going to be a follow-up or, you know, if, uh, if if I'm even going in that direction. Um, there's so many different ways to approach um, interaction with objects in the world. And you can see that in the differences in games, like um, Half-Life, Alex doing it in a very different way than, say, Boneworks or, say, um, Job Simulator or, or games like that. So... It'll be fun exploring different techniques there, and uh, and I think I'm going to do it uh, more often in that way, where I'll do a live stream where I'm just experimenting with techniques to then turn into a um, a tutorial later on it's for people who just want to have the condensed version and, and just see uh, the conclusion of it. It probably, and, and this is something that I'm going to be experimenting with, so, so do leave some comments if you guys have some ideas about that. Uh, it probably means that I'm going to change the format of the tutorial somewhat instead of um, building something and, and watching me run through code very quickly. Uh, it'll be more of, here's the code, review it, why does it work the way that it does, um, how do you use it so that you can you know, set up something new? Um, that, that's what I'm toying around with for those tutorials. We'll see how that goes. Um, hello, SSLAX. Uh, thank you for joining. Master Ox, hi, how are you? Um, thank you guys for, uh, for being here again. Always nice to see names that uh, I've seen around for a while. It's really cool that you guys join in every, uh, every Friday. Um, okay, uh, before I start... Go on, get going one second. I'm gonna just open a window because it's really, really hot. It was raining all day, so I had to close my windows. But uh, it is getting a little, uh, little warm in uh, in Australia at the moment. So uh, uh, while it cools down a little bit at night, it is still uncomfortably hot in this room with uh, all the lights and stuff. So I uh, have to uh, have to deal with that. Um, what else happened this week? Um, well, I don't know if you guys follow the, uh, the Facebook page for Godot, um, but uh, Jan, uh, God, what's his last name? Uh, <laughs> I forgot his last name. Uh, Jan from, um, um, well, he, he's done a couple of uh, courses now for, uh, for Godot. Um, he's been posting uh, videos of a little game that he's working on um, that... Um, that's really looking uh, looking very nice, little uh, wipe out type uh, game. Um, so I've been helping him a little bit, seeing that there are a few overlaps between what I'm doing in my space game and what he is doing in his game. Um, so yeah, it's been a lot of fun just uh, just helping out a friend and uh, um, 
and seeing him make some progress. So that's uh, that's really cool. Um, what else? Other than that, it's just been a busy week at work, as per usual, I guess. Um, so yeah, uh, that's really just all the catch up as far as the last uh, week is concerned. Um, because of the stream that I did on Sunday and a bunch of experimentation that I've been doing during the week, I haven't done much on uh, on our little uh, space game um, in the week. So we're just going to um, start off where we left off last week and, uh, uh, and add some more logic. So uh, I am thinking of looking first at our little target reticle and making something in front of the selected target so that we can see where that person or where that ship is going to be if we shoot at it so that we have something to aim at that uh, that takes the speed of the enemy ship into account. Hiya Plato! Thank you for joining. All right, so um, let's have a look. So last week we worked, oh that's all in the player script of course. So if we go to our player scene, no, not you, our plane player. I need to rename a few of these uh, these scripts. They, uh, the names don't really uh, fit the bill that well anymore. Well, it's hidden somewhere in here, but we, uh, yeah, the target indicator is the last thing that we worked on uh, last week. Was it this one? Might not, might not have been this one. Which one was it then? Target reticle. That's the one. Sounds like thunder outside. I don't know if that uh, my microphone picks that up, but uh, could be, uh, could be fun. All right. So it is pretty small. I can't really zoom in on it to, uh, before it disappears. Um, it's pretty big in game, so I probably still need to uh, play around with the size a little bit. I'm not too happy with the image that we uh, we we grabbed last week. Um, I think it needs to just be a normal circle, but um, we'll replace that in due time. I am going to reuse this um, this image for uh, for the next step. Um, so yeah, let's go and build that. So the idea that I'm having is we have our so is this this one? No, that's that guy. Is that then a target indicator? I think that might be our target indicator then. I think so. Yeah, this is that guy that um, that draws the little square around the selected target. And then the target lock is that diamond that sort of comes in. So um, that is already tracking the location of our um, enemy. So we should be getting enemy information in here. Now what this doesn't know about is the weapon that we're using right now. Because that is what we did with the... And I need to rename that. I spelled that wrong. <laughs> I need to find out how to spell reticle properly. I -f -f -e -c -u. No, No idea how to... Is that an acronym? <laughs> um, thank you for joining. Funny the names that sometimes come up. Says the guy who is called Max online. No. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, what was I saying? Um, so yeah, when we look at this, we are communicating what weapon is being selected so that we can use the projectile to get some data here. So it's actually... Maybe we need to add it into our target indicator and have our selected target tracked there as well. Um, I think that's probably a good idea because else we have our weapon information in two places and because we're processing all our information here already, we're getting our, um, our weapons velocity. I think we're going to be using that same information to figure out, um, where we're going. So it doesn't mean that we don't already have our... Target here. Target velocity. What are we aiming for? Oh, because we didn't build that yet. We just hard coded our distance to a thousand. So yeah, we do need our um, our target here. Okay. Then I think that's the same thing that we are going to add in here, and we're going to do that with the same approach that we have a selected target. So I'm actually going to go. 
don't actually like the name of that, but we are going to copy that as a base. And I'm just going to call that set target. So here we're simply going to have target, and that's a friend or foe. There we go. So that's whoever we are targeting. So we can say target is new target. Well, that needs to have a little more, which is um, if we currently have a target, we need to release that. And if we have a new target, we're going to have some initializing to do. A bit of a joke name. Yeah, well, yeah, why not? Um, so, ooh, that's a really bad place to put my drink. I'm going to move that somewhere else. And that does sound like thunder outside. Um, I think I'm going to do that as well, but we want to do a connect and disconnect on when our target dies. So, and here I'm just calling it target. I don't really think it's really that needed to, uh, <clears throat> to call it anything more. So the thing that I wanted to do here is if target is new target. So if we're trying to uh, select something we've already got selected, there's no need to run this code because we would just disconnect our signal and then reconnect our signal. That doesn't really make much sense. I am going to put an else here because we're probably going to hide or display our targeting reticle there. Um, that means we need a clear target in here. That gets called if our target gets destroyed. There we go. And that simply means that set target is going to be set to null to release or you know, to unset the target that we currently have. Now, just seeing if there was not, there wasn't anything else that was being done there. So yeah, it's going to become a similar thing as our selected target. Now that means that here, what I want to do is if we don't have a target selected, I just want to use that th you know one kilometer as a guide for where we want our reticle. But if we do have a target, then what I want to do, um, and I just want to see, do I want to, no, I'm just going to put that over here. Uh, that's fine. So then our target distance becomes our, um, target dot global transform origin so wherever our target is located and um, that's actually a good one because didn't we have a method that already um, hold on I thought we made a method for that because we are already storing that information But we're not returning that. Maybe we should. Or is that overkill? I think that's going to be overkill. I'm just going to do dot global transform dot origin. So we are going to get that. And then we need to take away. And that's then something that I wanted to look at. So our target indicator is a spatial, is it? I think that is a spatial, isn't it? That is a spatial. So that should be a child of our plane. It should not be positioned. So that should actually be at the origin point of our plane. Uh, oh, that's a target indicator. And of course, need to do the rectal. Oh, same, same story. Same story. So we should just be able to get the global transform of our cells. And we need the length. Now we don't have our opening bracket yet. So let's put that in. There we go. So now we have the real distance to our target. Um, yeah, which, uh, which is exactly what we want to do here. So now the thing that I'm wondering about is, should I just move that? into here because if we don't have our projectile set that means that we don't have a weapon selected 
And if we don't have a weapon selector, we don't know where to aim anyway. So, hi, Glenn. Dorteus Maximus. <laughs> That's a good one too. Um, works for Mux as well. Maximus. <laughs> or Maximilian. For those who uh, saw the old black hole movie that Disney made in 70s or 80s. Can't remember. Um, okay, so. So that should already mean that our reticle is now positioned based on uh, on our target's distance. So as our target comes closer, our reticle should actually start aligning with our target. But that means that we want a second one. Now this is interesting because if that is a spatial that is on my plane, which is this one, and we are trying to position this in the world. Then I need to do my little no trick again. I wonder why I didn't do that. So, um, we need a node so that our so that our coordinate system becomes global instead of local. And that means that we need to do that. So now that also means that I really want to make sure that oh, this one is only visible if we have a weapon selected or if we have a projectile and therefore have a weapon selected. There we go. And in other cases, we're making that false. All right. Um, so that means that I want a second one of these and that's going to become Target. Vertical. Still need to figure out how to spell that. <laughs> Life of Brian. I haven't seen that in ages. Uh, but yeah, cool movie. Very cool movie. All right. So let's go and hide that in this case as well. <clears throat> there we go. And now we're going to see if we have a target, then we're going to position that thing. Actually, let's just do node target ready, but visible is true. I don't think there's really any performance penalty in setting a already visible object visible in every frame. Um, but if there is, we can always improve that logic. <clears throat> Let's go and have a look where. So we already have our time to target. So now what we need to do is do something similar like this, but not use the weapon origin. Why is that still weapon origin? That doesn't make any. Oh, because we're looking at the weapon origin. Okay. And I want to transfer. So I'm going to keep that the same. I'm just going to copy those lines because we basically need to do exactly the same thing. For a target reticle. The difference is that instead of calculating it from the origin, okay, so that means that location. That means that I actually want to store that because I. Never like accessing things more than once. And of course, we have to do this here and then repeat that there because we want to override our distance so that we can use that in the calculation here. But we don't want to set up our target until we have done all that. So, um, target location plus target dot um, okay now I do need to see what that's called what did we name it 
I think that's the delta. No, that's the delta position. Oh, base velocity is as a vector three. Okay, cool. Let me double check. How are we called that? Yep, and we had a velocity. For, okay, so our base velocity. So get the same as that. All right, so get base velocity. So we need to see how fast our enemy is traveling and the direction in which it's traveling. And then we multiply that with our time to target. So we're looking at how much time is going to take our bullet to travel from our fire from our gun the distance to our target and again you know in that time our target might fly closer or farther away from us and that's where the inaccuracy comes in but that's fine um but we're calculating that 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 time to target and now we're going to see um how far our enemy ship will travel in that same time and that's where we're going to place our radical and we're assuming of course that our um our gun or our bullets travels way faster than our enemy ship. All right, then we need to do that look at to make sure that it faces us. So that was that whole problem that we had with the, the billboard uh, not working perfectly in VR. And again, that's not something that you guys can really see on screen. That's something that I can see in the headset. It's really clear that um, you know your your brain's got you know it's it's really geared to to properly inter. You know, understand stereoscopic images so it really figures out what you're doing with a billboard um, it's seeing straight through the trickery that a billboard does um, but this kind of works around it so that's good and we orient it to our weapons transfer which in all fairness should be the same as our as, as our plane it should just be slightly offset so we could even make this face our our center point our craft we don't uh, but you know our weapons is, is fine too um we make it invisible. So I think, in theory, we should now have both our aim reticle of where we're aiming and our reticle of where we expect our target to be if it keeps flying um, in the direction that it's flying. So uh, let's go and have a look. What's the approach you're using to calculate where the object will be? Okay, yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm uh, I'm doing right now. <laughs> and, and again, you know, I am. I'm keeping it simple, you know, I could, oh, okay, that's where indeed, ah, okay, and I need to do that from a target reticle as well. This is what you get when you rename stuff. So yeah, so there is obviously a margin of error in here because I'm not uh, adjusting the distance to uh, uh, to what the target is, is uh, traveling. So if I'm looking at, that's the distance to my target, my target is now flying in that direction so it's, it's getting closer and closer and closer so my bullet would actually not travel as far um, that you, you could do a proper formula to take all parts into account and really get our uh, accurate um, aiming but you know we have to leave something to the player as well you know we shouldn't make it too easy um, and who knows maybe we'll, we'll do that math at some point but for now <sighs> okay 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 actually you're going to be set visible in process and here we've got a process because it's the weapon is all important here um sorry i'm just holding my <laughs> just holding my uh, <laughs> my headset under my chin Yeah, we could do a bunch of calculus if we really want to, but um, I need to grab a piece of paper and figure that all out. All right, I'm very sorry, but we're going to have some beep, 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 beep. Oh, um, I forgot one thing, and I always press the wrong button. And the thing that I forgot is actually tell... Boom. <laughs> He's gone. Uh, we have to tell our... Um, our target indicator that we've selected a target or else it's never going to go and run this logic so we are going to go back in i think it's in here no it's in our pl uh, plane script here we go um okay
I think it's handle target input, isn't it? Handle lock, no. Handle target input. Input, closest body, select. Okay, so we've got an underscore select target somewhere over here. There we go. So our target indicator select targets is already set. Um, so here we just need to go. Okay, there is something to say for. Uh, Um, there is something to say for consistency and naming, so I am going to rename this to, where are you, ready to go? At some point I really should refactor some of these. Um, let's go and close that guy because it's giving all those errors now. Um, so it's that one, it's that one. I am going to leave that as target. That's just an internal name. So now we should be able to select this thing. And I really need to figure out a nicer way to uh, to make a target lock sound because I'm really getting annoyed with that beep. <laughs> All right, let's go and position. All right, what have I got selected? Okay, now we can see what he's flying to. Now, what I'm very surprised at is that it's on our target. So, I guess it's really expecting, me. or maybe he's really slowed down. He's really slowed down, I guess. Because I'm not hanging still, and he's hanging still. Oh, now it's moving again. All right, so there's something wrong in his AI. He suddenly stopped moving. Now he's flying again, now that... Radical is showing where he's going to, but it, I think he stops. Yeah, that beeping is pretty annoying. Ha! Ah. I guess it is time to start working some more on the uh, on the enemy AI because. I think the logic that I wrote before was that I'm trying to get him to be behind me. And then when he's behind me, he's trying to close in and shoot. And when he gets too close, he cuts his engines. Now, in this case, he was still too close, but I was now facing him. And I guess he, because he's also facing me, um, the logic that he needs to try and get behind me again wasn't kicking in. Um, which is why he just kept hanging still there. Well, normally, obviously, if he's still behind me, he would still be following, uh, assuming that I'm trying to fly away, that I'm not standing still, in which case I'm a sitting duck and he can shoot me down. Um, so yeah, that's something that we need to have a look at as well. All right. Is that something that we want to work on tonight? I'm not sure. Um, for now, the targeted radical logic seems to be working the way that I'm expecting it to work. And yes, uh, we could do a little bit more here, uh, like I said, to take into account um, the target's velocity and therefore closing in us, therefore the, you know, the distance to target becoming smaller um, to get an even more accurate place that we need to uh, show our target but I, I actually don't think it matters enough um, we might get back to that I'm not sure uh, once we have our enemy AI getting a lot smarter I think that might be a, a uh, the right moment to revisit this and see if we want to make this logic smarter um, it will be the same for both the aim reticle and the target reticle it's both about the fact that I'm not taking into account that my target is either moving towards or away from me and therefore adjusting that distance accordingly. Um, I'll need to work that out on paper and see if I want to change that or not. But again, I think that uh, once my enemies are um, flying more consistent and are smarter, that's probably the better time to do that because then we can actually see that it works. And right now it's you can see how, how close our target reticle was because they're not flying that fast. They're turning towards me. It causes them to slow down. So, um, yeah, definitely something that, uh, that we need to put some more work in. 
Yeah, name changing is a um, a problem. Um, Godot does some of the name changes, especially file name changes. It's pretty good at, at going through the source code and finding it. Um, but real refactoring, as far as I'm aware at this point in time, is a matter of uh, going to uh, to search and then search in the entire, I think, find and files and find every every place that you've used the name, which uh, can be very tedious because then you need to decide, you know, is this actually the name that I'm changing or did I name something else the same? Don't know. Um, so yeah, it's one of those things that um, I am very careful with doing, but I do think that, you know, there's a lot of this stuff because I'm building it very organically. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I named um, at a time that I wasn't sure of the structure yet. So I do think that that refactoring is coming up at some point. Now, the new feature in GGScript that was introduced where you can type your um, your variables is helping a lot. Uh, connect returns a value, but this value is never used. Yeah, that's fine. What value does connect return? So that's our connect function here. Uh, so yeah, so I will do the delta, by the way. If we're not using the delta, I am going to go and underscore that one uh, just to make that go away. But I need to have a look at what the connect is uh, is all about. Um, but yeah, so so if you use typed variables in GDScript, it does help a lot because it will start giving you... Um, errors and warnings in your editor if you know if a name has changed so um so yeah that is that is definitely something where where that does become easier and i think that's something that they are working on in godot 4 to make even better so uh so yeah we'll uh, we'll see where that, that ends up but uh yeah renaming variables is a uh, a nuisance Okay, um, all right, well, we've got that working now. What do we work on next? That's a good question. Um, I just want to run through this one more time just to have a look at if there's anything else with this that stands out that I'm sort of going like, I would like to change the way that works. Yeah, so he really slows down very quickly. I'm wondering why he did that. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Okay, that's because I'm standing still right now. So we definitely need to make our enemies fly some more interesting patterns. I just want to get away from him. He might shoot at me at some point. All right, so. Actually, one of the things that I want to do at some point is that we can shoot at our asteroids and that we can actually see it, that we hit him. So they're still trying to, uh, to get to me, which is kind of fun. Um, I am actually too high in my cockpits. There we go. All right. Now, one of the things that I've been wondering about when we are doing something like this and we want to know some info about yeah, yeah that's still pretty cool. Um, we want to have some info about these regenerating. Um, about the state of our enemy so that we can debug a little bit better of what's going on. Maybe we need to create a little debug UI that we hover in our um, in our screen somewhere so we can actually put some things up. That might be a nice idea just as a as a temporary feature just for us to to use. Yeah, uh, Godot 4, I agree with you. Uh, although, you know, I think it's a bit of a shame that a lot of people are um, are deciding to wait for Godot 4 before getting into Godot. 
Um, that's a topic that's coming up a lot, which I think is a bit silly. You know, there's so much you can already do with Godot 3.2, and especially if you start with a brand new game, and it's going to take you a year, two, three, depending on how big your game is to make. Um, you get a head start, right? It's not like you're going to be throwing away what you do uh, when you move to Godot 4. Uh, yes, there will be refactoring. Yes, there will be changes. Um, but I think that the move from Godot 3 to Godot 4 is going to be less painful than the move from Godot 2 to Godot 3, uh, unless you start writing a whole bunch of shaders and stuff. Um, although they're going to be pretty portable, I guess. Um, but yeah, I am expecting for a lot of type of games that uh, Godot 4 will definitely have a lot to offer. Um, but, you know, this is all working on Godot 3, and we're even working on the Glass 2 driver. You know, it's still very capable. So, uh, yeah, uh, anybody who's thinking of uh, building a game, don't wait for Godot 4. You know, you're, just, you're not doing yourself a favor, if you ask me. Just go and work in Godot 3, and uh, you might find that it does exactly what you need it to do. And, uh, and if not, you know, by the time Godot 4 comes out, you have made a big head start. Um, that is a index. This little guy is my Valve index, which is uh, the um, headset that I've been using for this project since the beginning. Um, and, yeah, I love it. It's a great headset. Um, I'm using my Rift S for my object interaction um, to draw. At some point, when we're a bit further along with things, I want to. I had to move this project over to uh, over to OpenXR. Um, we're slowly working on the OpenXR drivers. They work on Linux. They don't work on Windows yet. Um, hopefully soon we'll figure out why they don't want to run on Windows. Um, but once OpenXR runs on Windows, I'm probably going to switch over to that and and use that for this project and then it's easier to switch between the two headsets uh, but if not um, I might look into doing both OpenVR and Oculus support in this project. I found that the Oculus under OpenVR uh, has some overhead which is uh, an interesting thing. Uh, I think I know why but uh, I, I had to work around some things in the beginning uh, when I first started supporting Oculus um, but yeah that's noticeable. So, interesting. Anyway. Um, um, I, I uh, simply say, if your project works perfectly under Godot 3, why migrate, right? Uh, especially if you're very far along. If you're like, you know, 60, 70% down your development cycle, why you know especially if your game is running fine and you're not experiencing any problems is that it even goes for the space game right uh, i'll it'll probably take two or three years to actually get this to a finished product um, i might switch to godot 4 maybe i might stick with godot 3 because for what i'm building um godot 4 doesn't actually offer that much other than the fact that the Vulcan driver would work better on mobile hardware. Um, as you know, the Quest and that sort of thing. But I'm not even sure if I would target those with uh, with this. Um, don't know yet. Okie dokie. Um, oh yeah, I keep forgetting that if you save that one, it starts screwing up. Because it's a tool script, and I do things that it doesn't like when it gets reloaded. Um... Let me load up my... Where are you? Scene. See, I am lost within my own project. Okay. Cool. Um, hmm. I wonder why that was. When I was playing this in game, I had very hard light on the side of the aircraft carrier and I was wondering why that was happening well this is now because there's all the icons coming in the way maybe it was just it's probably the glare of the Sun that I was using in uh, when the game runs anyway 
that's the path of our asteroids. I think we're going to work a little bit more on the AI because I've been wanting to uh, to do a little bit of polish on on how the AI works, um, so that we can move some of the AI also onto our missiles. Uh, because right now we have a sort of double imp implementation there. Um, although they probably will stay separated, I'm not quite sure if that's uh, if we can use the same scripts for those or if we just need to find a way to uh, to make some of the logic more accessible so that we reuse more of what we're doing. Uh, yeah, Godot 4. Don't expect Godot 4 to be released um, this year. Um, it might end up going in beta before the year is out. That is definitely what um, they are saying that they're targeting. Um, but I think it will be similar to when Godot 3.0 was released, where where it went into beta, you know, at the end of the year, and then it took about, you know, probably another three months before the official release was out. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if Godot 4 goes down a similar path, because there's a lot of things that, that won't come to light until people really start using it. And people don't start using it until, you know, it's released as a, as an official beta build. Yes, Hugo has got his nightly builds that a lot of people are using. But there are still very few people who will make that, uh, that jump. Oh, I forgot to put this guy on. Should be giving it a little bit more. There we go. Anyway, um, so when we look at our friend or for for AI, what I've done is I've I've created that states property here, and we've added our chain state logic in here. Um, I hope that you guys don't hear my kids in the background because <laughs> they are. I think they're watching a movie and having a lot of fun. Um, Anyway, so the thing that I'm wondering about is whether to leave this as an extended script or to actually put this as a um, special node um, that we can add in other places. And that's actually, that's probably where I am going to go with this. And then we just need to repeat that node in a few places, but that's okay. Um, so where's our AI stuff? And this is the downside if you work on something else for a little while is that you forget where you've put certain things okay that was in the states so let's put something to the test and actually I want to rename this to AI there we go and that will probably mean that I should go and have a search for states. So that's all our node, so that's fine. But we don't have our path anywhere anymore. So it should still run. Also, it'll give an error that it can't find a file. Okay, so that still runs, so that went fine. All right, so we're gonna go and create. Um, I'm gonna create a new 3D scene because I do want that as a as a scene, or do we just do it as? No, I actually don't need to have this one as a scene. So instead of that, we're just going to go to scripts and file new scripts. And that's going to go in our AI folder and that's going to be called AI and I'm going to call that AI brain. All right. And that's going to inherit from spatial. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. And that's going to get a class name, AI Brain. Okay. Um, why did that not save? No, it did. 
They call me a nitpicker, but that needs to be a capital B. There we go. So there is our AI brain. I'm not going to put anything in there just yet. <clears throat> and now I'm going to go to my enemy. And I am now going to go and add my AI brain in there. There we go. So even though I didn't create a scene because I gave it a class name and I, I inherited it from a spatial, it is able to put that straight in there. And that works really well if the script just works on a single node. Um, some of these others, I wanted to do the same thing, but because I've got a couple of um, nodes that I add in that I add in for debug, um, that kind of breaks it. But we might actually go back to, to doing that once we get some of that debug stuff cleaned up. And then I actually don't need those sub scenes. I can just add the, um, the script. And this is just basically convenience for just creating a spatial note and then adding the, um, the thing in. All right. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to move these all in here. So we're moving them out of states into that because we're going to now use that brain as our main logic. Cool. And now we broke everything. <laughs> um, the next thing that I want to do, that is the wrong set of projects. Uh, I need to go in here, close that guy. Did I just close the wrong one? No, I did not. I hope. Oh. Um, and what I want to do is I want to go in here this is the only thing that I haven't found out. I don't think there's a way to do this in the interface. Uh, but I want to now inherit this from the friend or foe scene, not the friend or foe AI scene, because that's going to disappear. We're going to move all that logic into our brain. All right. And it also means that this guy is going to be subclassed from our friend or foe. We're probably going to have to do some more stuff and change around because it's uh, it's currently assuming that a lot of the logic is in different places. Um, I'll also go ahead and do the same thing for our fighter because I think, no, I hadn't changed that one. That's still on friend or foe. So I've only changed the bomber to have uh, NPC logic at this point in time. And this is another reason why I think putting that in its own script so that we can just add it in makes life a lot easier. All right, so this guy should now inherit directly from friend or foe. We're no longer using, um, and that's, yeah, our, uh, our states node is now gone as well. So that's good. All right, so now we need to start moving this around. Now this is a tool script. So you can see already that it's starting to, uh, um, to complain about things. <laughs> but I'm not sure I, it would give a cyclic uh, thing here. Anyway, um, now why did I create this as a tool script? Because it had to be a tool script because our friend or foe script is a tool script. So I don't think that had anything to do with this at all. So I'm just going to go and start copying things from that one into here. And then we'll start looking at what needs to change. <clears throat> now, why is that giving me a cyclic redundancy? I think we, uh, we're just going to keep going until we... Because that just goes from spatial and has the name. Oh, well. I think we might have to reload in a minute. Uh, that's the wrong one. <laughs> okay, so we no longer care about the editor hint because we no longer have that. There we go. Um, actually, let's do that because I think this is going to be annoying if it keeps saying that.
There we go. Actually, should be able to go directly in here. Is that now cleared up? That is neatly cleared up. I think it is because it had the old version still loaded, um, and it just ended up confusing the whole thing. Um, and now we're just going to go and copy these guys around, and they are going to go in here. But for now, instead of sending through self, we're just going to go and send get parent, and that's a little bit dirty at the moment. But it is really correct because that is, you know, we're we're doing it with the underlying, um, the underlying object. So now one of the ways, uh, there's just two ways we can make this prettier. Um, the first one is that we actually set an NPC um, property on our brain. Um, and the second is that we check if we are if we've been added to the correct type of class. Um, and I'm probably going to go for that last one where we're going to get a warning if it's actually we'll, we'll do that right away. I always forget what that thing is called though. Um, I think it's this one. Oh, but then we need to do it as a tool script again. Um, oh well, I guess it can't hurt. But that does mean that um, we should do this. Yeah, we'll never have a current state in our yeah, so. because we don't run our default states here, and therefore that should be relatively safe. Uh, although I could say, nah, leave it off. All right, but that means that I should now be able to add in that one. Um, Think. String. And just for fun, just to uh, we'll add that in. Um, no nope. models, enemies, lumber. So, ah. and we'll see that there's a little triangle on our AI brain, which now says this is what that does. So, basically. This allows us to put a little bit of logic in here that is run inside of the uh, the Godot editor where we can do some checking and then return a message if there's something wrong. So in this case, we can say if get parent. And for that, I need to go and have a look at our object class. And we should be able to, well, this is a class itself. I want to see if it is is class. There we go. True if the object inherits from, so that one will check whether our, um, our node is of a certain class or any of its um, higher classes, any of its uh, classes that gets extended. So we're going to check oops, if this is a friend or a foe. And we obviously want to say if it's not. Oh yeah, that also means that if everything's okay, we want to return an empty string. So that should mean that obviously doesn't get updated right now because we just oh, really it does. Why not? Lumber sends friend or phone.
Uh, all right. Not get parent is class friend or foe. So does that only work with Godot classes? Oops. And not with um, script classes? That's interesting. Or did I type it in wrong? Friend or foe. Class name. Friend or foe. Let's just copy it in. No, it's uh, correctly named. Let's just open it back up just in case. No, that's interesting. Um, hold on. What we can also do, actually, for parent is get parent. There we go. What does get parent return? Because we might need to cast it. Um, I think get parent is a property of. No, that's a property of node. Get parent, get parent, get parent. So that returns a node. I think because of that we. Um, it's actually not classified properly. That's my guess. But what we could do, where is that? Um, search cast, not array cast. How do you do that again in Godot scripts? In GD scripts. Uh, GD scripts. Class note to class. Ah, body as player. Okay. Let's see if that works. Okay. Parent as friend Oops. or foe. All right. Does that work? No, it does not. Now this guy could be that I just haven't saved it yet. No, dot dot dot. All right. We are not getting our parent here. That is weird. Why are we not getting our parent here? Unless, for some reason, it doesn't think. Our parent is a friend of all. That doesn't make any sense to me. Did I somehow? No, it definitely <clears throat> on a normal level. Am I getting a parent at all? Yeah, I'm getting. So the moment that I check that, it goes fine. So I can't cast it to that. <laughs> okay. 
Let's see if that works. I think because I inherited directly from... No. That is so weird. I'm guessing that this does not work with scripts that you've given a class name. That's all that I can think of. <laughs> Inherit the scares you. Um, I like it. Um, but then again, I'm a C++ programmer, so I'm, I'm used to inheritance. But it does have quirks. And I guess it's because it's not... It's not inheritance in the way that we're used to. It is... Yeah, I guess it is, because you're extending scripts. And you're basically taking a class and extending that class. Including the ability to override methods and that sort of thing. Although the weird thing is that sometimes, you know, like a physics process method, you're not overriding. It's calling the physics process for every every class that's part of your class tree. Hmm. But this is weird. Um, hold on. I want to try the other one. Let's see if that does work, or if it then also still fails. As, actually, let's save it first, so it goes away. As friend or foe, and it comes back. So yeah, I... I just think that it doesn't catch on to the fact that uh, that we're actually a friend or foe. Uh, just for completeness sake, because we did originally inherit from the script itself, I just want to see if there's any difference restarting this. And if so, I think we just found a limitation of what it is that we're doing here. And that's fine. Yeah, no, it's a limitation. Well, in that case, what I'm going to do, I think it's then overkill to have um, to have that in there. So we're just going to take that out. And uh, we're just going to duct type this for now. So we're simply going to assume that if we add AI brain, we're going to add it to a friend or foe. And if we add it to something else, which is going to be interesting because that will be, so that something else will be our missile, we um, we potentially break our system. But for now, that's what it does. It's going to go and send our parent there so that our scripts still work with the correct NPC. So even though I could here say, you know, get parent parent, I think that's a little overdone. That needs to be friend or foe. Yeah, I'm really starting to, uh, to really want to type everything. So, uh, we will keep doing that. So here we're getting our NPC to these uh, methods and running our, our logic. Now, the next thing that we need to double check is it does our change states. So I think that because we move these, we've broken all the change states. All right. Oh, I need to go and get the original name of that. Um, that is going to be, yeah, so that is actually going to have to be called on our brain. So that's interesting. So our chain state should be calling out a chain state function on our brain. I do need to get the right name for that, which is that one. Okay. Oops. And again, this is actually where I'm wondering... I think we're going to change that because right now it's a signal. I'm giving that back as a signal, but because we are building a system where we know that the AIs have to be part of the brain um, and it really doesn't make any sense to put them in any illogical place. 
or any general place. Um, I'm actually thinking that we're going to change that out and we might make it a convenience function or do we just change emit signal? I think we're just going to change where it says emit signal. No, I do want to put it in our base state. So where is my base state? Hey, hey. Here we go. So this is right now a signal and I actually want to change that to a function. Um, and in this case, we are going to go and call um, get parent change state um, new state push state and again you know well you know what now that means that we need to make all these things stool scripts which I don't really want to do Well, it goes against my grain to call get parent and not check, right? Uh, even though this is designed to be always to always be a child node of the brain node, and therefore you know you you create this interaction between the brain and the states. Um, it still feels wrong to not check things, and I don't want to do a has method here every time that we do. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna sleep on that one. I think there is there is a way to make that nicer, but uh... hi, Paolo. I am glad that you're learning something from this. And Plato, um, I haven't used Game Maker myself, so I don't know how Game Maker has done its uh, its inheritance. Um, but, you know, I'm sure they found a nice way of doing it. Uh, I'm just going to go and... Okay, that's interesting. Um... All right. Because this may then makes more sense to have a name instead of... Uh instead of a reference. And I think we're going to do that. We're going to change it that way. You know, we've got, we've got new code here. So, yeah, I think that is fine to do. So we're actually gonna change this to a string. There we go. And that means that here, We're going to go and say um, var new state node. Actually, I'm not going to go and. Uh, actually, yeah, that needs to be base state. There we go. Get node. So that's going to get an, uh, a child node of our brain. New state. So our, our new type needs to be in this list or else it's going to fail. And we're going to go and add that in. That's perfect. So here we now do we get no default state. So we're just going to push the default state in like that, which is fine. And that solves that. Okay. Which now means in our base state, we can say this is a string. This is a bool, and we're happy with that. Okay. So now we need to fix up all our states. Just fine. And now we can say, instead of doing our emit signal here, change states, we can actually just change our states. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's see. There's one thing that I want to change here. Um, 
No, that looks like this. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that we only call get node new state if we actually have a state, else we're returning null. And that means that in our text state, instead of doing that, <clears throat> we can now do change state false. There we go. All right. Let's see. Do we do any other state changes here? I don't think so, because I think this one only leaves it. Okay, perfect. Sweet. All right. Let's do our follow path next. So here we now do a signal found target. So that's what I want to change as well, is <clears throat> see if we can actually, well, that one might, we might still need to send back because it's actually our, um, our bomber that does, needs to do a little bit more. So here we have found target. We first, oh, that's actually on that one. That's interesting. Okay. That can become this. I think we are going to leave that like this because that's, I think, the only way to do this bit. But I'm not convinced this is the right way to do it. Because the thing is, all these states work tightly together. So even though I need to make sure that they're added here, I don't really see a reason why they couldn't just directly access those states. Um, and even then, you know, it's even questionable. Well, I guess it makes sense to always have them here so that we can, can configure settings. So right now, these things always... Oh, no, we have a whole bunch of settings already for those, so... Hmm. Okay. So let's let's keep that in there. But that then does mean that I need to go follow path found targets which means that we need to hook that back up because that broke. Oh, look at that. Perfect. And that's then the same for the get behind targets. So we'll leave those as such. Okay. However, everywhere where we do emit, well, now emit signal target, we keep that same way because we're now handling that on our main. And again, I do want to at some point figure out if there's a nicer way of doing that. And that doesn't ever do anything else. All right. So follow path should be working again. All right. Let's go and have a look at our get behind. So again, that does that signal, get behind. But that also does our change state. So in this case, we can just change, whoops, change that to change states. Empty, false. But we are going to do our behind target signal. Okay, cool. And then our wingman. Again, change states. Empty, false. And we're going to go search on that just in case we missed it somewhere. All right. Search. Find in files. Whoa. Okay, that was almost wrong. I didn't want to replace, I want to find. Oh, well, luckily I didn't find anything. So hopefully that doesn't mean that we just removed that from a bunch of places. But it didn't give anything in the log, so I don't think that is the case. So let's see if everything still works or if we just broke our whole program. All right, here we go. Object nil. Um, 
Okay, that also makes sense because we had that and now it's gone. <laughs> uh, so let's bring that back in and that now needs to be a sign. Oh, and that now needs to become a different type. So this is not actually no path. This one is actually just string. And maybe I even need to do that an enum at some point in time, but that's all right. Oh, and it hasn't reloaded that. So let's go and reopen this thing. Boom. Brain. Okay. Ah, that is because <laughs> it's already has a default assigned. Okay, so this is going to become AI follow path. There we go. There we go. And actually, if we don't have any default states, it shouldn't error out. We should check whether we have any default states. There we go. Okay. Global on nil. So we're not getting our NPC here for some reason. And the reason is we are... This is strange. This is really strange. That means that our get parents this is giving us For some reason, we're getting a doesn't make any sense. We're getting a parent node that we can't properly interact with. It's not recognizing it as a friend or foe um, object. I don't get that. All right, I want to try something weird. I have no idea if this is going to work, but I'm going to try it. So I definitely want to just send through a bit larger NPC here. Which of course we haven't initialized yet. NPC. So if we have a state and we have an NPC, then we're going to handle those, or else we are going to ignore things. Oops. And here I'm going to do get node dot dot. Print NPC is. All right. So obviously, if that doesn't cast properly, it's not going to crash. But also, our enemies aren't going to do anything. Trying to assign value of type rigid body to a variable of type friend or foe. Why? Okay. Now. That's a friend of foe scene. This 
So inside of this, it knows that it's a friend or foe because we could send self to it. But outside, when you exit it through nodes, it doesn't. That's really weird. That is really weird. Now, there's a very dirty trick around this. And maybe for now, that's just what we're going to have to do. And that's simply that we're going to set the NPC. All right. And in our bomber, Sorry to work. Um, then in our bomber, in our ready, we are simply going to say AI brain dot set NPC. Not sure why that's not auto completing because we haven't got it open. So here, because we're inside of our script, this script knows that it's a friend of focus. This is what we've been doing before. It's weird. It's a little ugly that we have to set it that way, but if that's what makes it work, I still think it's very strange. Why? Maybe because it's an inherited scene? Okay. Object string. Yeah, that's right. That needs to become a string. Oh, not that. This. I need to figure it out. That's it. I think it might have got something to do with the way that the... Because obviously I, this didn't start life as... Uh... Oh. oh yeah, that's because I got this one lying around. <laughs> this didn't start life off as, as the script that we've inherited. It started life off as a normal script. So we can see that our NPCs are still doing something. So our follow logic is still there. And it's attacking me. I just want to get the wing leader destroyed to see if our... Oh, they are... Hitting each other right now, which is really interesting. Which one's the wing leader? I think it's this one because he's trying to attack me. Wah. Yeah, you're still flying there. Oh, the other two guys are coming. Haha. <laughs> Whoa. All right. Still trying to get behind me. That's at least a good thing. Oh, they hit me. It bumped into me. Now the problem is that I have no idea who's the guy that I'm supposed to shoot down. Is it this guy? Yeah, it's this guy because I've heard him quite badly already. There we go. Okay, now the big question is is this wingman now going to try and attack me? Uh, I think so. Yeah, he's definitely turning around. Where are these guys? Over here. So, our AI is now moved into the brain logic. Now, I'm not completely happy about everything, but I do think that this structure is the way that I want to go. And again, our main reason is that we now have the uh, all the brain logic self-contained into a new node into an ai brain node with all the sub nodes and we can start using that in different places so obviously the brain right now doesn't do a whole lot 
it just handles the state changes, which is what it was in the uh, friend or foe AI script before. Um, all right, so, but I'm not quite happy about the fact that we need to do this. That is all right. And the other thing that I am not sure about yet that I think is a bit ugly is doing this because our other objects, our other states knows what it wants to change. It just, just, it just doesn't have access to, um, to the other states node. But it makes sense to me to actually have these lines of code in the other state that is pushing the state change so that we actually don't have to add any specific logic into um, because again, once we start we using these states for other NPCs, which you know, once we have multiple enemy crafts it makes sense. Now you need to know that you need to create all these signals and, and implement all these signals. Even though the AI should be smart enough that if the other state is there, um, then it can use it. So obviously one option would be is to obtain the state from the brain. Which is, you know, fancy way from just getting get node. <laughs> and move it into... Uh, into the file in that way. All right, before we do that, I want to do one more, or actually a couple more things. First of all, I want to do some cleanup because it should be so that we no longer need this guy. So it seems to be happy for me to delete it. Doesn't seem to be used by anything else but our bomber, which is good. All right. So now the other thing is follow path. So let's have a look at follow path. So yeah, here we do our emit signal found target. We found a target. We're now going to go and attack that guy. And in this case, it kind of does make sense that that's a signal. Because who's to say that our reaction will be to attack this guy? Maybe we want something else once we detect the target. I don't know. That's our old friend or foe path. I am, I'm going to leave the signals intact for now because I can see as many reasons for changing it as I can see reasons for not. Um, I do think that in case we do want to do that in the future is add a get state function here. Um, and this is simply going to return get node state. Um, yeah. Oh, ah. Sorry, I've been used to programming in Rust today. Oh, I need to specifically cast that. Okay, so um, state node, AI base state, let's get node state, return state node. All right. Now we know that this works because we've been doing the get so uh, get node a lot. So what's the difference? That's the thing that I don't get. That's the thing that I want to figure out. 
is When we look at our bomber scene, so we look at our our we look at our brain note here. We can see that the script is external resource fourteen, and and actually it's these that are even more important. And those are even scripts because I'm adding the uh, I'm adding the sub scene here I'm not even adding it as a where are you extends from the fall you know what I think that we need to try and do could that work could it be as simple as that? Because we are not defining a class name for our bomber. And that means that our bomber script doesn't become part of our class database. Let's see. Let's go back to our brain. Hi, Rodzilla. How are you going? Nice to see you again. So I'm going to uncomment this. <clears throat> um, and I'm now going to assign it. Oops, that's not a var. NPC is get parent. I'm going to assign it there. Let's see if um, If we now actually get a valid NPC here. Well, we're not crashing. We're running. Let's look. Look at that. For every NPC, we're now loading it. So that was our problem because we didn't define a class name on our bomber script. The script for the bomber isn't added to the class DB, which means that when it tries to evaluate what what class structure, inheritance structure there is on the class, it can't find it and therefore it can't determine it. While for our um, our AI states, we consistently added the class name in. It, it kind of makes sense. Um, so, yeah, that means we don't need to do this one as a workaround. I do actually like the NPC in there, so we're going to go and keep this in here. But um, I'm going to make this a tool script again. So we're going to take this out. Don't need that. Which means that... And I always forget this bit. Here we go. We're going to go and put this in here because I don't want to do my default states when we're in tool mode. <coughs> there we go. So now we get when this thing is instantiated, we grab the NPC. So that should even be there in design mode. And that means we can now implement this guy again. Where are you? Get configuration morning. Brain. Which returns a string. Which should return an empty string if you don't have anything. So if we don't have an NPC, we're going to say uh, this must be a child of friend or foe. All right. And this time we don't have a triangle. Now, if we go and grab our AI brain and add it to our def timer, we now get our, this must be a child of friend or foe. And doing that, make sure 
that um, that things are placed in the right place. And that kind of protects us um, from doing stuff here that is not designed to work. Um, so if we would add the brain now, and again, this is something that I need to change now. But if I now add the brain to my missile, because my missile is not a friend or foe class, um, it'll error out on me. But I do want to use my brain there. Um, and I think the way forward there is that the bits that we need to control this guy with the NPC, we actually need to do uh, one level down from this. And that could even be just a, a blank script. Or a script without a scene, I mean. Um, and really all that we need to do is, is this stuff, right? This is the stuff that we, we have on there. Although some of the AI things are, they do require a friend or foe. So that's gonna be interesting as well, where, um, for instance, our follow path could be any rigid body. But our attack target has to be a friend or foe because it needs to be able to fire weapons. Go to solution for extending class as you'd be adding child bounds. No, no, no. Um, so I'm... Um, the, the problem is reusability, right? So in this case, in my system, I have friend or foe as a base class. Now our enemy bomber is extended from there. So that's a properly extended script. Uh, our friendly is there as well. So I've got my friendly, um, you know, which is also what the player character is using. So this one, again, is an extend of friend or foe. Now, what I had before was I was extending friend or foe to friend or foe AI for the AI portion and then subclassing um, the other ones. Because I've actually even our player, um, our player plane, and again, this needs to be renamed. This one is, again, subclassed from friend or foe. So all these three all inherit from friend or foe. And I just had put the AI in between, but because I want my AI logic to not just work with this, but I'm going to start building my AI logic to work with um, other things that I need to control, like the missiles and, um, well, basically missiles. I'm not quite sure if there's any any other sort of things that will have, you know, which will control. Um, instead of it being a subclass of friend or foe, in which case I had to duplicate that logic. I wanted to, that to be a child node that I can add in so that I can now say on my uh, weapons, and again, this is gonna fail right now because we haven't made it work properly yet, but I can now on my missile, I can now add my AI brain. And again, this will now complain because it's not a subclass of friend or foe. Um, and I can add my um, values there. So, The choice now is to have a script that grabs those bits that we need for most of our AI to work. And it's, and it's just convenience methods that I added to friend or foe that get information about heading and speed and stuff like that. Um, that's the reason why I'm specifically checking for it to be friend or foe. Um, So we could put that in front of the inheritance tree if we wanted to, or we can make the AI brain more forgiving. That's the other, the other choice. Because one of the problems that I have is that some of the AI steps require, um, require the friend or foe, because when it's an attack logic, it needs to fire the weapons of the friend or foe. The missile won't have weapons, so, um, then again, our casting will actually work there. Because 
the AI brain might say, you know, this is an AI control controllable thing or, you know, whatever we, we end up calling it. Um, You know, when we have then our <clears throat> our attack logic, now that's going to get that as a parameter. If then the casting logic says, but hey, hang on, what you're giving me is not the right type, we end up with a null um, a null object, and we can simply check for that and and just not execute our AI logic. So. Yes, that's the problem right now. The missile is inherited from projectile. That's our base. So that's just a rigid body. So we would set something in front of this. And it kind of kind of makes sense. Because it's all this stuff, right? This is continuously repeated. Because that is what I need to access here. So my friend or foe, where are you? Again, we also have that logic. And then we just add this bit with it. Um, seeing this is a tool script. That is being executed, which is dumb. Okay. Definitely don't do this in the editor. Dumb. Hmm. Well, I guess I'm not against it. Because it does make sense, right? You know. Hmm. Let's let's try it. Let's see if we can make it work and see if we can move some of the logic of the missile into its own AI state. Um, and take it from there. See if it wants to work. And that means moving a bunch of this code into something that we actually inherit this from. And that doesn't actually need to have its own class, I think, or its own uh, its own scene. It can just be a script file. So let's see. Um, I just want to have a bit of a look at how we've organized this. So that's all the models. I think that's fine enough. So our weapons are in there, which is cool. Um, what are we gonna call this thing? Because this is the one thing that I, uh, I actually need to figure this out someday. Is delta position is the movement since our last frame. And our base velocity is then that divided by delta to get a um, a velocity per second in as a vector, as a directional vector. That's the whole thing why I've done this here because I don't want to calculate it again and again and again because I need it in multiple places. Um, it just makes sense to just do it once, have it available, and then use it everywhere. Now, when we look at a rigid body, rigid body, we have our linear velocity here, which is the current velocity that we're traveling at. Now, in theory, you would assume that is equal to our, you know, the velocity that we calculate. Um, 
maybe slightly more or less depending on how we're accelerating because it's the velocity that we're you know, we're going at or you know or if we just bumped into something it's the velocity that we end up with and in that respect it makes a lot more sense I actually want to test that first. I want to test this. I'm going to go and delete my brain. And and the reason that I'm thinking about this is if we should really be using our linear velocity instead of calculating our delta velocity from our last frame, if we can make that um, if that's stable enough then maybe we should just make sure that our AI is working with the rigid body. That kind of makes more sense to me because, yeah, let's let's have a look at that because it's um, it's in it's been interesting to figure out why that wouldn't work. So I think the best way to do that is to go back to the thing that we just created. Where are you? Where is our instruments? Here we go. And we go to our rectangle. There we go. And I'm going to call that guy test. Boom. And actually, I am going to make that a sphere mesh, which is now really, really, really big. And we're going to make that a lot smaller. That might be too small. I don't know. Yeah, it's definitely a lot smaller than our... Oh, but our rectangle is, is drawn on top of it. So that's kind of cool. Uh, I might make it smaller than this. We'll see. Um, I want to give this a color that nicely stands out. There we go. And I'm actually going to make that unshaded. So that it really stands out. Um, okay. And what I'm now going to do, I'm not going to worry about it being visible or invisible. Let it just be wherever it is when it starts. I don't care. Test. Level transform. Build origin. It's going to be target location. Plus, and now we're going to be using our rigid body. So, our linear velocity should be the velocity of our um, of our target, and we're going to do time to target. So, in theory, our circle, our globe, should be overlapping our reticle. And I had problems with that before, but I'm starting to wonder: is that really something I did wrong or not. Okay, we're going to get an annoying beeping sound again. I wonder which ones it got selected. When. Oh, that's that one that's behind on my ship. Okay. Okay, I don't see my ball anywhere, which could be that it's just... Okay, because I really don't get why it stops moving. All right. So, I think this is a problem with sizes. Sorry, I'm going to balance this on my head again. <laughs> um, so, I've made this really small because that thing is small. But, um, actually, these are stupid sizes. I'm going to put them back to... I'm going to make it half. There we go. Because in space... You don't, you know, a one centimeter object is like a speck. So I think we just size that really badly. Okay. That was, uh, that was a ball not moving. 
Okay, so now we can see still too 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 small. Now it's hidden inside, unfortunately, because this thing stopped moving. So let's make it fly towards us again. I don't know if you guys can see it, but there is a tiny green ball right in the middle of this thing. So I think that whatever reason I had to conclude, I'm actually going to make this thing a bit bigger. Three, six. There we go. I'm not quite sure what you mean, uh, Clint. Because I'm not trying to extend um, the class with this object. There we go. Yeah, so it stops moving, that guy. It's so annoying. I don't know why. But I think our linear velocity is slightly off. And I think that is because our velocity is probably updated slightly quicker. Okay, this guy has stopped moving. This is what I don't get. He stopped moving. He's turning towards me now. And now he decides to move again. Alright, that's really interesting. But, using linear velocity is actually working properly. So. So, what I'm going to do... I'm going to leave that test in there for now, because I want to keep seeing that it keeps working. Uh, you, oh, you mean that I keep modifying it in uh, in here, in, in my text editor, because I can't change... Uh, that's just... Um, when I've got my scene, so if I want to create a new NPC... Let's see, where are you? Not player. Models. I extend my friend or foe model, so he would create a new one, and I would load in my my new NPC. So this would become my new NPC script. So that's proper class extension, extending, right? Um, and that follows through. And it's the same if I if I create a script from this. So I don't actually have another another object to do that with. But if I have another ship, that's what I would do. I would I would now add the model in there and hook everything up and start deciding. Um, if this is an AI controlled object, I would now add the AI in there as well. But as far as the subclassing of the class goes, that just goes in here. And same with the script. If I subclass the script, it will be subclassed automatically. The only thing that we just found out is that we do need to consistently put in that class name to give the thing a name. Uh, it's not automatic. Um, it's not taking the name of your file because that might not be unique enough. Um, because you could have the same script, the same name in multiple places in your source file code if you want to. Um, so we do need to give it a class name. That's all there. But what I'm doing with the AI brain is a very different concept. There, I am not subclassing something. I'm adding something. Just like if I look at my plane, I'm adding all these objects. Because only my player will have the... Um, or, or, you know, the planes that my player can fly will have the, uh, the UI elements. So I'm only adding them here. Those are not subclasses. They are components that you add in. Okay. Back to what we were doing. So, the thing that I'm thinking about is when we look at our AI brain, is I'm actually not going to care about this being a friend or foe. This one is going to be a rigid body. Very cool. And that means that in here must be a child of rigid body. So now my brain can be added to any rigid body object to control that rigid body. Now, that could still mean that some of my states here um, will need um, different logic or will still need to be a friend or foe. So here we have a choice. Now, when we're looking at our follow path, 
I think we can make that work just fine with a rigid body. The thing just is that we need to make sure that we're not using any of the functions that I created. So let's change this guy to say, I'm happy for that to be a rigid body. Sweet. Um, that I needs to be changed in my base state as well. So I'm definitely going to just send a rigid body here. Rigid body, there we go. So that is not happy. Cool. Now, if I look at this guy, what's this guy going to say? Yeah, so he, this guy doesn't like it because um, I'm still defining that as friend or foe. And in this guy, it needs to be a friend or foe because a tech target is actually going to be calling. Where are you? Um, in handle is going to be calling uh, fire weapons. And that's something that's only available on friend or foe. So I actually need to do a little bit of extra logic here. I need to do an extra cast here. Um, so yeah, let's go and clean these guys up. I'm actually going to start with follow path. Because the other thing, of course, is we need to make sure that we're not calling any of the functions that we added. I don't think that we are. No, follow path, we're not. Now, wingman, we are, I think. Okay, so this can also be a rigid body. There we go. So we're getting our origin, we're getting our facing, that's all fine. Then we're getting our wing leader. We're going to get that position, that's fine. And you see facing, that's fine. I don't think there is anything in here that doesn't work with a rigid body. And actually our wing leader is a rigid body here, which is kind of interesting. I didn't even make that a friend or foe. Okay, so I think our wingman logic is good. So now get behind targets. So again, a rigid body. That's the only thing that we've done here. It doesn't really do anything else here. Targets. Okay. So target, I'm actually happy to be friend or foe because that's definitely something that we do here. And this is this is something that you know this is a class that really only makes sense to be used with friend or foe. But I still do want this logic to at least not use any of those functions. Are we? Again, we're doing transform there. Doing that. It's all good. Okay, cut off. I don't think there's anything in here that uh, that it will have a problem with. Okay. Now, the other thing that I'm thinking about is not to parse the NPC here, but actually get that from its parent when we initialize. That's the other thing that we can do here. Okay, so that's the attack target. That's the only one that I think is going to be tricky. So let's start here. Rigid body. There we go. Now, I don't seem to be using here we go, get delta position, target velocity times get delta position.
Why did I normalize that? Okay. So I think here we can just do. Oh, hold on. Target is friend or foe. Oh, but that's still a rigid body. Why? Oh, it's not... if I don't change this first, my other stuff isn't working. Okay. Okay. And if we don't use delta, we're gonna just gonna go underscore delta. And that's fine. Oh, I think we are using delta here. Yes, we are. All right. So. So here we can just do. Linear velocity times time to target. That'll work. Okay. Now here we have MPC get velocity. And that is our velocity as um, as just a distance, so that's just length. So there we go. We can get rid of that as well. So here, we have a problem that we do need that to be a, all right. Um, so here we're gonna cast it. That's gonna fill our thing like crazy. And we only need it there, so I'm gonna leave that on FPC, that's fine. Okay, so are we doing any of the functions here that we need to be careful of? I don't think so. So, this is where the brain is really something that we wanna use in, in different scenarios, but the individual states may only be applicable with friend or foe. and. Right now, I'm doing the check over here, but I think that one of the things that we can improve is actually get the MPC um, loaded and handled um, in our base anyway, because now we know that it's always going to be a child of our brain, so it can interact with our brain. We should be able to, to just initialize that and ready. All right. Um, let's see if this still works or if we broke it now. And I think I'm going to look at more places where we're currently using uh, our calculated delta and just switch back to using linear velocity because we've got it available. So, you know, why calculate something that we have available? Now I'm just going to leave this like this. I just want to see if everything still works, if they're still attacking me. Actually, let them uh, let them move behind me. I'm just going to go. Yep, they're getting tracked. Um, let's just do it like this. Boom. Let's see if these guys get behind me. Oh, look at that. Oh, and he's, he's shooting at me. Okay, so that all works. We didn't break anything. That's a good, good sign. Okay. All right, um, no, brain, where's my brain? So one of the things that I wanted to do here, make sure that we only execute that if we actually had default states, so if nobody build an array there, it's still null, we don't get a crash, because there might be situations where that applies, where we don't want the AI to immediately start doing stuff. So let's make it safe. That now needs to be a rigid body, that's cool. All right. Um, then I actually want to do the same thing here. Okay, same. 
and that means that we need to make these all tool scripts but that's uh, so here we have our own functions that we are we are doing so we don't really have to worry too much about that uh, so the only reason that I make this a tool script is that we can do a func. Uh, I always keep forgetting the name of this function because it's way too long. Get configuration warning returns a string. And here, what we're simply going to do is parent AI brain. Let's get parent. So that should now work now that we know that why that wasn't working before and if we don't have a parent what we're going to be doing here is return um, let's keep the naming this must be a child must be a child of AI brain there we go so that means that we need to make all these guys tool scripts unfortunately because it doesn't inherit that property from its parent. There we go. Text script. Base. Brain was that. Follow path. Get behind targets. And wingman. And if we now, let's go close here. If we now go to bomber. Let me go and have a look at these guys. Then uh, there are no things. So again, if I add it in the wrong place, it's going to tell me <laughs> configuration warning null. Okay, really? Why is that not returning as a string? Sorry, I'm just doing something really crazy because I just want to see what's going on here. So now we get that everywhere and it needs to be that, okay. Now if we do this, no. So I'm guessing that because of this, that actually escapes out. Okay. What if I specifically ask for it to do this? Ah, that, that it likes. Okay. It likes that. So I guess because I'm not explicitly doing that conversion, but I'm doing it implicitly, it doesn't like it. That's fine. And now I get the proper message. Okay. So the other place that we did that, which was attack target. I just want to put that in there. And I think that doing it this way means that the null will be typed as friend or foe instead of um, it just failing that line and probably giving some sort of critical error, which is probably why um, that triangles had just a null as, uh, as a warning. All right. So at least have that as a protection that we can't accidentally put that in the wrong place or we get a little triangle to tell us, you know, that that is what we uh, we want to do. All right. Now, I want to go and work on the missile, but before we do that, I want to go and have a quick look here and try and figure out why it's not losing this. Okay. So it's working through the target angle. So we're getting our target angle here. Okay. 
35 degrees. What is it doing here? Embassy facing cross target heading. So he's facing towards me and I'm looking at the target heading. I'm not looking at my heading, at the... Uh... How is that done in the get behind target? Because what are we doing here? Here we're doing that and we're steering. And here we're doing that. Yeah, exactly. That's the check that we should be doing. Okay. So. I'm actually going to move this. To here. Do this check first. Can we move it even higher? Might actually even move it higher. So somewhere here we have our NPC facing. That's already over here. Let's do this as the very first check. And what we're going to be doing here is we're going to take NPC facing and we're getting a dot product. And it's now, important to know, right? When when two vectors align, the dot product is one, and then the further away we go, the further away we turn, it eventually goes to zero when we're uh, perpendicular, and then when we're facing away from each other, it becomes minus one. So what I'm doing here is I've got a a uh, angle thirty five degrees, which gives me a cost value of I don't know zero point eight or something. And I'm saying if it's smaller than that, if I'm going more towards the zero or minus one, that means that I'm no longer facing the right direction. The problem that I have in this logic is was I was using my heading between my NPC and its target instead of saying, what's the orientation of the target? Because we want these guys to be facing the same way. Um, the other thing that we need to look at is... We do need to see if this is, let me think. So we're facing the right way. Yeah, because once we know that we're facing the right way, but we are now, um, yeah, so that, that's gonna become an, an easier target there. That, I'm not worried about that. Um, so here facing dots is uh, going to be with targets. Let's actually go and move this up here because we need that. Target transform dot basis dot Z. Okay. So are we no longer Facing in the same direction, then lose target. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I want to get this one over there as well. I think that's, even though we don't need it yet, I kind of like grouping things that belong together. Um, did we move too far away from our targets? And lose targets. Boom. Actually, kind of got that. Uh, actually, let's just do this. If 
So we just say that's what this is going to be doing. Um, catch up. So obviously at some point this needs to, you know, this is now always full throttle. Um, but I think at some point in time we, uh, we need to uh, throttle that a bit better. Then here we're going to try and steer towards our enemy. It's all good too. Let's see what exactly are we doing here. That's all right. Oh, that's our debug info. Okay. Are we using our velocity somewhere here? No, I think we're going to actually go and take that out. Uh, I do want to get my uh, that thing here. So here we look at our target heading and then across. And actually here I want to do if it's smaller than zero. Um, we are facing away. Uh, actually, uh, now we are facing away from our targets. Uh, we must have gotten in front. So that is a second check that I want to do here. That means we're also going to leave. Okay. So we're no longer doing our debug thing. Attack target. Where are you? Uh, oh, AI. So that was to position this one. So I'm actually going to get rid of that. Okay. Boom. I don't care about you anymore. I think that's all good. And that actually means that I'm going to go over here. That's cool. Don't have to worry about that. See, is there anything that I need to change from the inspector? Now I've got all default values. Let me get rid of this one. Delete. Okay. Because I actually don't want that scene. I just want the script. There we go. All right. Let's see if that fixed our bug in our target. Hi Davies, thank you for joining. I am glad you're enjoying 3D, even though that's not uh, your cup of tea. That's all good. Um, set follow path in base spatial. What are we doing wrong here? AI brain, AI follow path, set follow path. Okay, what did we mess up here? Set follow path is over there. What were you complaining about? Still need to go through those errors in the, or warnings in the startup. Okay, so what was it saying? Set follow path in base spatial. Okay, yeah, I know that's the spatial, but it has a script. Okay, hang on. Let's go and close a whole bunch of things. Nice. What did we end up breaking? All right. Is there an error in my script here? Let's 
So I'm going to clear that so that we actually see real errors in a minute. Why are you having this as a problem? Hold off. Yeah, that's what I was doing. AI brain, AI follow path, set follow path. Why? Because yeah, that is a spatial, but it's a spatial with the script. In this case, it's even a spatial, which is, this has to be seen because we need a radar object. So why is it not happening? That's some on there. I don't get it. One resistance function set to the bar in base spatial. We didn't even touch follow path, we just did something with attack target. Why is the scene still there? That's probably because we still had things open. That's what I did before. Did we delete the wrong one? Oh, base state. Shouldn't be a script for that. Brain shouldn't have one. Follow path, get behind. They're all still in there. Okay, what am I overlooking, guys? Class AI base state was, oh yeah, but a script couldn't be loaded. Okay, so, whoops, <laughs> that's just the wrong button. So we have a bug in our AI base state, and therefore our follow script can't be loaded, and that, uh, that flows through. So what did we damage in here? Oh, look at that. Class AI ray couldn't be fully loaded, script cyclic. Dependency. Why do we have a cyclic dependency on AI brain here? Here's our AI AI brain. There we go. Oh, hold on. Ha! Because AI brain requires base state, and base state requires AI brain. Okay, you know what? Let's see if that one wants to work because now we're just. What do you mean get parent isn't declared in a current scope? Oh, because that needs to be a function. All right, here we go. Oh yeah, that's right. Same thing there, but they are being set in code, so that's good. Um, all right, uh, where's my enemies, bummer. All right. Have a look. Must be a child of AI brain. So 
Is that because we couldn't load AI brain, or is that now because... This is actually not working. Um, first of all, I want to see if actually the thing works now. Okay, so we are working and our enemy ships are moving. Okay, so that's good. This is so annoying. So is class doesn't work with our custom classes. Well, we can do it very dirty. Check if it has a mythical change state. Does that work? Just in case it has something to do to suck in memory. And also I'm just gonna disable that warning, you know, it's I'm the only developer on this thing. I know what <laughs> where I'm putting my uh my nodes. Oh, why is it uh, stuck? Hold on. There we go. Perfect. No. So I can't properly check for the class because we get a cyclic redundancy because now we have one class referencing that class and this class referencing that class. And I'm guessing that it doesn't like loading it. Um. We'll leave that out for now. It's not important enough. It's it's something that I do want to get working at some problem uh, at some point in time. I do believe, as a developer, um, that if you intend something to work in a certain way, you want to communicate that to any other developer who uh, who might work on your project alongside you. <clears throat> And this is a very good way to do that. So, just keep an eye on the time. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So, we now have a brain that can work with any rigid body and many of the nodes that we created so far, many of the states that we created so far, as you'd say. Um, can work with it as well. Oh yeah, we need to check whether our NPC now reacts properly or not, as the case may be. Let's have a look if uh, if we get if it gets in front of us, whether it's then going to change state to get behind us again. All right, needs to go get behind us so that it can get in a state where it wants to try and attack me. Ah, oh, wants to go behind me again. Ha ha.
Oh, right now it should figure out. Yeah, we need to have some sort of debug window that allows us to know what our our NPC is thinking. Because right now it's not deciding to move. Oh, it decides now to get behind us. Interesting. Yeah, we need some sort of thing that tells us what it's deciding to do. Because we can see that it keeps throttling down. And deciding to stop in the middle of space, and that is something that it shouldn't be doing, because if it's... Let's have a look. If it's running through its get behind targets logic, what are we doing here? If we're out of range, get out of there. Cool. We're always throttling when we're in this state. And it's just trying to fly to being behind us. And it's steering towards us. It's always trying to steer toward uh, towards us. Okay. So at which point... If distance of target is smaller than minimum target distance, that's fine. If dot bigger than zero, so we're facing towards it. And as long as we're facing the same direction. And then we're going to go to behind target. Okay. Um, I'm going to do a really quick and dirty trick. Why not? Actually, I do want to add a signal here saying no state changed new state. Actually, no, I want to do that with current state dot name. So here we then need to do if current state, then we emit it else. We're just going to emit blank. So, uh, okay, that's Always feel that. Uh, that now gives us an error because our script reloaded. It now doesn't have our variable set properly. So our NPC variable here doesn't work. Now that is run reason to say here parents widgets body is get parents as widgets. So this we can do because rigid body is a built-in one. Yeah. And always do it like this. And that actually means that our ready, I don't even care about that anymore. I don't want to run any code um, in the editor because the only reason this is a tool script is so that we can run our get configuration warning. And that's really weird to me, you know, I think that uh, well, I know why, because the tool script is the thing that makes this thing run. Uh, and it's really an all or nothing thing. But, uh, yeah. It would make more sense to me if uh, 
if this didn't have to be a full tool script. Okie do. Um, so, we're going to do something here just for, uh, excuse me, just for now. How are we gonna do it? It's a good question. All right. All right. This is just gonna be for testing anyway. So um, I'm actually gonna go call this debug. Oops. There we go. And. No, that's right. Oh, XR tools. <clears throat> Soon I'm going to change XR tools to actually also be properly class based so that you can actually just find your nodes in your scene tree. Not tonight, though. All right. So I just wanted to create a viewport 2D and 3D. All good. Um, this one should move up a bit. There we go. Um, where we? Oh yeah, that's because of this. So, fifteen by ten? No, that's too much. Fifteen by five. Perfect. All right. There we go. Sweet. That's what I wanted. Um, let me think. Times two. I think that needs to be 100 then. Yep. Okay, transparent, that's all fine. Then we're gonna add a little scene there. So we're gonna add a little debug scene, new scene, that's gonna be a 2D scene. That's just gonna have a label in there. Boom. Label, no, text, whatever. Um, I really want to just create a folder here, debug. And this is going to be debug text. Boink. I'm actually going to go rename that properly. Debug text. Hello. Um, I therefore want. Okay, minimum size. This was 300 by 100, because I want to see how big it is. Okay. Then I want to go into custom funds. Now, I hope that I've got them here. Fonts. Did I ever add my font setting? Yes, I did. 24, is that big enough? Let's go one size up. 48, there we go. Now, that means that I want to center it like that, and I want to center it like that. We just have some text that we're rendering into this thing. So we're going to use that as our, there we go. So that's just so that I can, uh, I can set my text. So I actually don't care about any of this. Funk set text, text string. And that's now going to become label dot text is text. Boom. Sweet. Alrighty. Okay. Um there we go. Now that means that this viewport I can't remember how I am is that true for size. So it's in correct in signal. I vaguely remember. I've got update mode to always here. Really? Oh well. It's a bit overkill for what we're doing, but uh, sure, why not? That's small. That's something I need to uh, change. I think I need to. Uh, I need to make a once. 
update mode so that we can trigger updates. Okay. So, we've got our debug, we've got our viewport 2D in 3D. We now need to assign our scene here. Debug, debug text. Which means that we now have hello above this thing. And now we're going to add a little bit of logic. So, Okay, so this is purely for debugging purposes. We're just going to go into process. We're going to make sure that this thing always points to us. Do we know us? No, we don't know us, do we? We don't have access to the player position here. It's a bit of a pain. How are we going to get to the player position? Um, project settings. Auto load. Player inputs. Okay, I'm going to I'm just going to go really dirty here for a minute because it's only for debug purposes that I need this. Um, where is that? It must be in player. Player inputs. Here we go. So, what I'm going to do here is um, actually, you know what? I'm just going to create a debug. A debug script for this. And we're going to add that in debug here. We're going to say, oh, do I have a new script? And we're going to call that debug states. Boom. Okay, we've added a new script, but I don't see it. Debug state. There we go. There we go. Our player location vector three, and um, actually that can just become a export for vector three player location set get set player. Ah, oh, we don't need a set get. We're just gonna leave it like that. We just need the storage base for it, really. Okay. Yeah. Mm -mm. Let's go. Debug, debug state, um, no, I'm going to keep the naming convention going like I have it here, and there we go, boom, okay, now, um, player scene, okay, Good enough for me. Um, oh, I need to go and import this. So not you. Close. So that, oh, that's a plain one. Okay, where are you? Plain. Plain. Yeah. Uh, the thing that I'm looking for is this. Because I'm too lazy to look up how to write that. So obviously this is going to be debug. Uh, what do they call it? Debug state. Debug state. There we go. The player location is. Yeah, we're just going to use that. How do we do it on the camera? We're going to do that on the camera. ARVR camera dot global transform dot origin. It's surprising how little it matters whether that is very accurate or not. 
Uh, but it does mean that now we basically have a player location available in, a, in our global space. Um, and again, I'm just doing this quick and dirty because I just want to have it accessible in here. And we're purely just doing this for, uh, for the sake of getting some debug info. So there we go, debug state. And that means now in here we can get we can get our um, okay. What we need to do here is for look at. Debug state dot player location, but I now need to get origin dot y. Um, no, don't need to do that actually. What we're going to do now is debug dot viewport dot look at um what debug that one thank you uh look at debug state i'm not going to use that variable i'm just going to put it in there but now here i want to do Debug um, Actually I don't care. I can just do global transform dot basis dot y. I want to make sure that that's upright. Alright. Alright. Now we haven't changed the text yet, but I just want to show you guys what this does. Well, if I didn't make any mistakes, that is. All right, I think they're going to be too small. I think I need to make them bigger. But, oh, we also need to make sure that they are, ah, what are you doing? I'm stuck on him. It's annoying. All right, I definitely need to make them bigger, but we've got a little hello on there now. Why it's mirrored? I'm not sure. I also don't know why the positioning changes. Is that the top of it? It must be. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Okay, anyway. Okay, we're going to do this differently. Um, because it's almost what I want, but not quite. Yeah, 
because I actually want to keep it up. Now I get I I'm, I'm not sure why it looks like we're looking at it from the back. Um, that's the other thing that I'm not quite sure about. But anyway, um, I always forget which way around the cross products go. Um, oh, what? Four to nine. The next player location on base. No, we don't have the debug states. Because it's a tool script. Come on. Okay. Again, this is uh, this is one of those things that I really hate about tool scripts. You know, it should be possible to limit which functions are actually available within the tool script when you just want to have some visual feedback and things. Yeah, well, that's why I don't want to use billboards, because the problem that you have with billboards is, first of all, that it sets it on a flat plane in your view space. Um, and then when something moves to the side, your brain actually interprets that correctly. You know, on, on, the, on a 2D screen, you don't notice it, um, which is why they do it that way, because it's nice and performant. You know, it's a trick, right? That's what people tend to forget. Billboarding is a trick. It's an optical illusion that prevents you from having to render an immense amount of polygons by just rendering an image of the object that you're rendering. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, a trick that you're doing for a performance so that you can render like a whole forest of trees and then only the trees that are close to you are actually 3D models. Everything that's you know a little further behind is just images and you get fooled by it. Uh, but on a monitor, you don't care about the fact that um, that thing is camera aligned because we're just taking out part of the view matrix. Um, because on a screen, the optical illusion holds. But in VR, because now all of a sudden you've got a stereo, your brain sees a flat plane that's rotating in a really weird manner because it's not a real tree. It's it's a flat thing that is camera aligned and that is turning in an incredibly unnatural way when you turn your head or when you move your head. And it breaks the illusion completely. So what I'm trying to do here, same thing that I've tried with a few other places, um, is to use look at to actually orient a flat space to face you so that when you're looking at it, it looks correct. But... I want to make sure that it stays upright. Right now it sort of slants down or lies down on the object when I'm looking at it from a top angle. And that's what I'm trying to, to avoid. Um, but that means that I actually need to keep our Y in, uh, in check. So I'm going to create a new basis. Um, and then our basis.y is going to be global transform dot basis at y. I want to copy that from my origin. <clears throat> then I want to go and I need to create a heading. Uh, and that's going to become viewport dot global transform dot origin take away debug states player location and that needs to become normalized Sorry. so this is looking in the direction of the player let's have a look at uh, what else is in Yeah, I could hard code the um, the no path to the ARV camera, but uh, again, if I move stuff around, it breaks all the places where you got that that path hard coded. So I much rather have something that is actually meant to be global. Um, and again, there will only be one player. Well, <laughs> if we ever made split screen multiplayer, this will fall uh, apart as well, right? Um, but for the intensive purpose of what we're doing right now, because it's just debugging. You know, it's just putting debug information on screen. 
um, I'm not going for the neatest solution. I'm going for something that I can do before the night is over. <laughs> Flat objects. Okay. All right. Um, so now Z is forward. X is sideways. So we're first going to go and calculate our X. Now, this is always where if you get this the wrong way around, things start to go inside out. Um, but we're dealing with something flat, so we won't even notice it if I get it the wrong way around. Unless it starts rotating the, way, the weird way around. But um, we're going to take a the cross product between bases and heading. Uh, and we're going to also normalize that one. And now we can get our forward vector. As that one. And that means our Y is fixed in place. Um, and we should be facing towards the player. Unless we're straight above this thing, um, then this might error out. I'm not quite sure what normalize does with a zero distance thing. So might need to uh, might need to do something for that all right and that means that in theory if i didn't get this wrong is i should just use that as my rotation and that's all all right so the other thing that i wanted to do is i wanted to make this bigger there we go um no not my viewport size the size at which is displayed. There we go. All right. Let's see if that is now correctly oriented or if I screwed up those calculations. Do, do, do. And seeing I don't see anything, I'm pretty sure I screwed up the calculations. Now it is possible that this thing is now facing away from me. There we go. Okay. So, okay. So, one thing that I want to do is get another mesh instance. There we go. And that's going to become a cube. And that cube needs to become a little bit bigger. 30. Boom. There we go, and that's just, there we go. That's just to see if we got the back of this thing, um, which probably actually makes sense to be honest, because, yeah, I need to do this the other way around. So there's a good chance that this will already fix my problem. We will see, we will see, we will see. Probably not. Okay. Um, I'm not even seeing the bar. That is really weird. Okay. What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Ah. Okay. First of all, let's have a look if there's anything weird in here that might tell us something. Non-existent signal changed. Signal changed. State changed. <laughs> okay. That'll work. All right. What am I doing wrong here? This is global transform. Basis Y. That's what we want there. Heading. Really? Yeah, that ain't gonna work. Have to do cross product with the right value, not with itself. All right, we see some white. It's a good sign. Let's see if we can actually see some readable text. 
Well, it's still backwards, which is really interesting. But it is facing us. And it's staying on the top of our object. So just rotating around its own axis. Not to mention that it looks good. All right. Now the only question is, why is it inside out? Now, because it was that way when I did the look at function, that makes me wonder. Hmm. Okay, that makes me wonder if this was the right way around after all. Let's have a look what happens if we do that, I guess. Okay. Um, we'll see. Is it readable now? Hello, hello. All righty. Oh. We have some text on top of our... Someone's shooting at me. <laughs> well, he's doing his job, that's good. Okay. Okay. I don't care about our little debug bar anymore. We now know that our orientation is proper. So what we're now going to do is we're going to go and hook up our state change. Boom. There we go. Okay. And we're going to say come on. There we go. Gets um, what's that thing called again? Um, no. Get scene instance. That's what I call that thing. Uh, set text. New states. Let us have a look and see if that makes sense. Okay. Um. Might simply be that it's not ready yet. Because it doesn't get initialized right away. So maybe the first time that this gets called, we don't have it yet. And that is a bit of a problem. Alright. What are these guys saying? Look at that. Get behind target and AI wingman. So he's already attacking me. Yay. I still got get behind target there. Still trying to get behind me. Okay. Let's go. And I actually want to make sure that we don't get too close to those other guys. So we're going to go and fly this way. And we're going to fly at half speed. And I want to see what happens. Oh, he's got attack now. Cool. Oh, let's get the hell out of here. And he's back at get behind me. Okay. Let's see if he will get behind me. Where is he? There. I was flying upside down, though. <laughs> out of way, out of way, out of way. Oh, this is hard flying upside down. Oh, and the other guys are coming in too. All right, so let's slow down a little bit. See if they can actually. Yeah, they're both attacking. <laughs> All right, so, well, it's fun that we've got that displayed above the characters.
but it's not very clear. <laughs> because you can't really see when they are trying to attack us because we have to, you know, kind of look behind us that way. Um, the other thing which I think is very important is that they don't try to write themselves in the same plane as we are. And again, that's not really that important in space, I guess. Um, however, um, we can see the state change, which is kind of cool. Now, I need to remember this bit of code. I actually need to store this bit of code here because that is that is a proper way to do, well, proper quote unquote, uh, to do a billboard that is aligned with the object on top of it, which it is. So this is actually kind of a cool approach um, to have some text above a target. So I do want to keep that. I do also need to do some improvements to the viewport 2D and 3D, because right now it is doing a lot of, um, what you call it? It is doing a lot of updates. Even though it never changes, right? So once the text is there, it should be rendered one time and then the texture should just be used. It should only re-render the viewport if the text changes. And right now it just renders at every frame, so it's just overhead. Small, but still, you know, it's waste. Um, so that is something that I need to start working on XR tools and improving that viewport 2D and 3D thing. And I'm actually thinking about, I'm probably going to make this logic um, a function of viewport 2D and 3D, where you just give it the location of your camera and it aligns with the camera. Could probably even get that from the ARVR server. That would be interesting. Uh, no, it can't be a a, uh, a vertex shader, uh, at least not yet. The problem that you have is that if you do that in a vertex shader, um, the the object is going to orientate itself depending on each eye's individual location. Um, so your eye is going to say, hey, or your left eye is going to say, hey, this thing is oriented like that. And your right eye is going to say, no, it's like that. And your brain is going to say, I'm getting very sick. <laughs> it has to be oriented in one way for both eyes to properly interpret the, the plane. And that, again, that's also one of the reasons why the billboard doesn't work, because the billboard aligns it with the camera's um uh xy plane um now that should be the same for both eyes but yeah like in in the end the big problem is that it sees it as a flat space and your and your stereoscopic vision sees it as a flat space you know it sees that it is an image oriented in a certain way so when you move back and forth it's like it it disappears off in the distance because it's it moves incredibly unnatural, and especially when you start um, um, rotating your head, you can see the plane rotate with you. It, it, it's you know what my hand is doing right now. That's basically what it's doing, right? That's exactly what it's doing, and you can see that rotation. So instead of something be facing you and and looking static as just you know, a, a pre-rendered asset that you, you properly light. Um, you see that effect. You see that movement because your, your brain interprets it correctly. And on a screen, the effect is still there, but because the screen is away from you, you've got a very, you know, a, a narrow field of view and you don't have your stereoscopic brain interpreting, you know, proper stereo images. It sees a flat monitor billboarding works you know billboarding is enough of a illusion for your brain to accept that there are a hundred trees in a forest instead of there are a hundred flat billboards with a tree painted on it that's really what it all boils down to yeah so indeed if you, if you send the player a location to um uh, 
to it, then yes. And and that's actually one of the enhancements that I've been wanting to do for a long time. Um, and you know, once we finally start um, doing a bunch of the backlog that we have around VR changes that we wanted to do, and and that we sort of been holding off to because they're breaking changes, so we didn't we didn't want to put them in Godot three. Uh, once we really start adding VR support in Godot four, I want to make sure that there's a bunch of um, the variables available inside of the shader, which are specific to stereoscopic rendering. So you know which eye that you're rendering, you know the the, uh, the center point of the camera, which is incredibly important to do things like this. Um, so I want much more information to be available when you are in VR and you're uh, you're compiling your shader in VR. And you know those variables might still be there in non-VR, but they just will be you know zero or the same as your camera location or something like that. Uh, but for a lot of VR uh, use, use cases, we, we need more information about the player's position in the shaders and which eye we're rendering. Um, and potentially even knowing, you know, having both eyes projection, mat projection matrices available. <clears throat> because that's the only way that you can do certain effects and certain illusions and, you know, um, all sorts of interesting tricks that you can do if you know that information like this. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Close one. I'm <laughs> playing VR. Yeah. That solves a lot of problems. <laughs> uh, I, I kind of, takes away what makes VR fun though. All right. So, um, all right. Now I really wanted to add the AI to the missile and start reworking the AI on the missile. Uh, because again, my whole point for all this work, all this the restructure of the AI system uh, is to make it more portable to other objects in the game. But we are already at midnight, so um, I think I'm going to leave it here for now. So um, sorry that has been a bit of a rework stream today. Uh, we haven't really covered much new. The, the, the little you know billboard thingy is um, is a nice one. That's pretty handy to uh, um, to at least see it working. Um, So yeah, I think that's where I'm going to leave it today. Um, happy with the progress, but a little bit less interesting, maybe. I don't know. I hope you guys had enjoyed it. Close one eye won't work. Retinal disparity. Okay. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> or, or close both eyes. That's a good one, Rob. Um, so yeah. Um, thank you guys for watching. Um, if there's any uh, questions, um, throw them quickly in chat before we call it a night. Um, leave some comments, actually. That's actually a good idea. Uh, leave some comments what you think we should tackle next, because I do feel that we are at a point right now where we have a lot of the basics of the game working. Um... And we need to start looking at okay, what is the ne what is the first thing that we're going to or the next thing that we're going to detail out because it's it feels like we're at a point right now where we have to start really putting detail into the parts of the game that we have. So either you know uh, making the AI work more uh, and do more and make it make it smarter, uh, looking at tools to uh, to put uh, levels together, like for instance, you know the the whole asteroid belt, making sure that that actually um works properly um so you know proper lod system uh, i've been thinking about creating the asteroid belt along a curve so that the input is a curve and it will create all the mesh instances or multi meshes around that curve to to build a larger asteroid belt um we need to start looking at a uh, at a mission system um so yeah let me know in the comments uh on this video um what you guys think we should tackle next? Um, should we continue with the AI, or should we do something else? You know, uh, we've been doing AI for a couple of episodes. Uh, 
Um, we had a little bit of the visual changes in between, but um, yeah, let me know what you guys think we should uh, we should focus on. So, um, waiting for uh, for YouTube's delay to uh, <laughs> come through. Um, I'm thinking about so anything that we can quickly improve upon. Yeah, because I want to start using. Probably should remove some of the debug stuff that we uh, we were throwing into here as well. Well, there's something new coming in chat, so, uh, so yeah, I'm gonna leave it here, guys. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, hope you guys had fun. Um, yeah, um, I might do another stream on Sunday. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, looking some more at the object interaction stuff. Depends a bit on what the kids are up to and uh, and, and whether I can uh, sneak some time off. Um, so no promises, but uh, but maybe. Uh, and else, um, I'll be working on uh, my video. I'll be posting updates on my Twitter. So if you're not already following me there, make sure you follow me on Twitter. Um, and have a, uh, you know, uh, keep up to date on what I'm working on. Um, yeah. Um, again, thank you all for watching. And uh, I really hope that you'll tune in again next Friday. So uh, see you then, guys.